welcoming back to our Perth studio now, Adrian Griffin from Lithium Australia. Adrian, we're going to examine the European portion of global lithium markets today. Can you set the scene for us? What's the latest? We know Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany, has been making some statements about phasing out coal. Well, she has indeed. I think if you look at Europe as a whole, there's an enormous amount of demand there, particularly with respect to EVs. And what that has prompted is the design and construction of six gigafactories in Europe. So they're underway. The funds have been committed. With respect to Germany, of course, phasing out coal power by 2038 creates more demand for lithium batteries. And, and that is because the coal-fired power will be replaced by renewables, and those renewables require a backup. In fact, Germany is planning the so-called intelligent grid to cater for that. I think the fundamental flaw that we've got here is uh, it's thought that the gigafactories will give you energy security because you've got the ability to back everything up and the ability to do it within Europe. But if you look at the way a gigafactory works, it's quite fascinating, really. They're assembly plants and you buy a cathode, you buy an anode, you buy the electrolyte, you roll it up into something that looks like a cigar, you go and buy a little tube, you shove the cigar into the tube, rivet a top on it, and there you've got, got a cell that goes into a battery. But where did those components come from? Primarily from China. So simply building a gigafactory doesn't give you energy security. It gives you batteries. Adrian, tell us what Lithium Australia is doing to help deliver energy security internationally. Uh, well, I, I think it's worth looking at our Sardisdorf deposit as a type example. Uh, and we've just completed quite extensive studies on that and looked at the processing technology that would take uh, the lesser known lithium minerals, uh, such as the lithium micas, from mine waste or uh, primary mine production through to lithium chemicals and then beyond that to battery components. And uh, your audience is probably aware of the fact that we've already done that with mine waste out of Kalgoorlie. So this is not a, a pipe dream. We've taken that uh, mine waste, we've produced lithium chemicals, we've taken it right through to batteries. So we've shown that we can actually do that. And there are many deposits such as Sardisdorf throughout Europe, which are unconventional lithium sources. But if you apply these technologies, and I've got to say, of course, they are proprietary technologies that... Uh, belong to Lithium Australia. But if you apply those technologies, you can take raw materials right through to battery precursors and create energy security domestically within Europe. And that's one of the aims that we have and using the Sardisdorf deposit to do that. Explain to viewers how this deposit differs from more traditional lithium providers. Uh, well, the, the conventional lithium deposits Spodumene, of course, and most of that comes out of Australia and it goes into China, gets processed there. Uh, and there's, there's a, a well-established process route for that. And it doesn't work on lithium micas. So uh, the deposits in Europe are primarily lithium micas. They're, they're uh, very sparse with respect to spodumene occurrences. So that lithium requires its own processing flow sheet. So you've got to design the right sort of processing to do that. In the case of Sardisdorf, it's a mothball tin mine. In the past, the tin has been mined, and those lithium micas have been discharged into uh, tailings dams, uh, and as a consequence, never processed. So the, the uh, deposit itself has never been a lithium producer. It's, it's been a tin producer and a little bit of uh, tungsten on the side. But we see it as a polymetallic deposit that can capitalise on the metal values including tin, tungsten and lithium. What is the latest on the Sardisdorf deposit itself? And is there a route to monetize this tin and tungsten that's there superfluous to the lithium? Uh, it, it, it's a great question. I, I, I guess, uh, again, your audience would be aware that uh, I'm often critical of the political systems. And in this case, the ASX will not allow us to publish the results of our studies as a consequence of not conforming to the requirements for a so-called scoping study. But believe me, we've done a lot of work, which is uh, not, not only uh, uh, desk-based work, we've done an enormous amount of testing, right through to pilot testing, and of course, producing cathode powders using the technologies that I'm talking about, 
and having them on test with major battery manufacturers in China and Japan. So it's it's not a study uh, on Sardestorf that we've done without a lot of backing. In fact, we're very confident of the commercial outcome. So uh, we can take the materials in Sardestorf. We can produce cathode powders. We believe that we can do that with a considerable profit margin. Now, that turns Sardestorf into the true polymetallic mine where you can mine and recover simultaneously the tin and the lithium. Are there any other geographies around the world where these novel processes might apply or are you really quite focused on Europe at the moment given the construction of those factories and EVs? Oh, in indeed we have got a, a strong European focus and I think we can provide to the European market something that no other company can provide. So that's a great opportunity for us and it's a great opportunity for Europe, quite frankly, to uh, develop that uh, power sustainability uh, by using materials from Europe. Other countries, sure, you know, we, we've got uh, heavy investments in Australia, Mexico uh, and Germany and a few other locations as well. And we're focused on primarily those materials that other people won't or can't process. And we have a number of deposits in Australia and certainly your audience will be hearing more about those in the future. These processes that Lithium Australia has pioneered, which are proprietary, have come at a, a bit of an R&D cost. We understand there's been some progress made with uh, regards to R&D rebates here in the political landscape of Australia. What's the latest? Is it promising for you? Oh, it, yeah, it certainly is. It's, it's been a, a game of political ping pong, really, with uh, uh, legislation going from the, uh, the House of Representatives to the Senate and back again. But uh, the Senate very recently uh, made uh, a finding that the proposed legislation was patently unfair to people that had based their business plans on the legislation at the time. And as a consequence, there's been a halt to amending that legislation. We've had a, a fairly significant push and I think uh, been perhaps somewhat influential on getting that outcome. So what do your shareholders have to look forward to in the near term in terms of key news flows then, Adrian, from Europe and beyond? Uh, well, if the, the ASX didn't have such draconian listing, listing rules, they could look forward to a scoping study from Sardestorf, of course. Uh, but we'll simply upgrade that and it'll be released as a, a pre-feasibility study in due course. We actually have a major workshop uh, taking place in Germany in two weeks' time to, to kick that off. So we'll see a lot of information coming out about Sardestorf. Uh, we're doing uh, a lot of work at you and me in Western Australia, which again is one of these unconventional lithium deposits. It's primarily lapidolite. We've got fairly substantial quantities of that over a strike length of about uh, a kilometre. Uh, we do plan to drill that and we've just flown some aerial surveys there. Adrian Griffin, thank you very much. Thank you, Danielle.